And so today, we're going to be talking about two individuals, uh, Joshua and Caleb. Now, we're not going to talk about everything they did, for if we wanted to talk about everything they did, we would be here a lot longer. It would take not just one week. We're going to spend one week with them. We would, it would be a much longer series. And so instead, we're going to focus on one critical time in their lives that impacted them dramatically, and it also impacted the entire nation and really the, the whole area of Canaan dramatically. And so we're going to be uh, mostly in Numbers 13. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Numbers 13. Uh, and while you do that, I'm going to pray for us and we're going we're gonna to get going. God, we are grateful for you, for your goodness, for your word, for your faithfulness. May we learn to trust your faithfulness, for we are not faithful and we need you. May we love you more when we leave than we did when we came in because we know you more. Amen. So as you already know, Numbers 13, we're not reading just one through the end. We're going to be jumping around. We're going to be skipping verses. This is not because some verses are more important than others. Right? All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is profitable. Yet, Scripture also kind of jumps around. It, it tells a story, but we're, we're focusing on, on one section of the story. Think, again, in movies and how in movies they, they go from scene to scene and different things are happening at the same time. We're just going to skip all the other scenes for now. We're going to just focus on the scenes with Joshua and Caleb. And we start in verse 1, which is a good place to start. But before we talk about verse 1, we have to realize that there was something that happened before this. There was something that happened before the Lord spoke to Moses. And this is found in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22. Deuteronomy 1, 22 says this. So Moses is talking to the people. And he says... See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not, be, do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send men before us, that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. And this seemed good to Moses. So the, the people take the initiative. They, they ask Moses, Moses, will you send spies into the land? Will you send spies so that we know where to go, so that we know which direction to take, so that we know what we're up against? On, on the face of it, maybe this sounds okay. And it seemed good to Moses. And then God commanded it. So that's the setting of, of where we are in Numbers 13. But, but even then, we have to look a little bit deeper. See, the people took the initiative which God allowed. And that, on its face, seems okay. We aren't told why the people really wanted to go. Right? I mean, it says that they wanted to go so they could spy out the land, so they could see which way was the best way to go in, and, and see the cities, and Yes, they wanted to spy out the land, but if they believed that God was on their side, they would not have felt the need to spy out the land. Remember, at this point, God is leading Israel every step of the way. He is, he is there by pillar of fire and by, by cloud. He is there to lead them. He is there to guide them. They are following him. That is what they have been doing. And so if they trusted God, there was no reason why they had to send spies into the land. For God would be leading them. They wouldn't need to step aside and say, all right, let's, let's figure out a game plan. Let's figure out what way to go. No, God is leading them. Their job is to follow him. Their job is to go where he sends them, where he leads them. They would not need to determine the best way because God would lead them as he had been since they left Egypt. So it seems 
a bit more than, than people simply saying, how should we go? What's the best way to spy out the land? There is actually an underlying lack of faith that the people had. And we know this because their actions don't line up with faith. Their actions don't say that they trust how God would lead them. Why then, so if, if the people have a lack of faith, why then does God say, all right, go spy out the land? If, if it's a lack of faith, then God could have easily said, hold on here. Let's, let's address the issue that's going on. No, God says, all right, go ahead. Spy out the land. Well, what happens when they spy out the land? God gave them what they wanted, and it revealed their lack of faith. God gave them over to their desires, and it revealed to them that they did not trust God at all. Know that it is not always helpful to know what's next in your life. It's not always helpful to know what you're up against. Have you ever looked back at your life and said, if I would have known where that was going, I would have gone a completely different way. But I'm glad I didn't. Because if I did, I wouldn't have learned all that God taught me. I mean, this, this is true in my life, that I, that I have looked back at experiences that I've had, and if I would have known the hardship, the difficulties that I was going to face, I probably would have chosen a different route. Because I don't like to go through hard times. I like an easy life. I prefer an easy life. And so if I'm faced with difficulties, I'll choose almost 100% of the time, I will choose the easy route. And yet, I also look back at the difficult times and realize that I had to go through those. That those are what formed me into the person that I became. That God has taught me so much through the difficulties that I wouldn't have chosen to go through, that I would have avoided... But God's sovereignty over my life knows that I need to go through those times. I am grateful now when I look back and say, I'm glad that I went through that. Because I had to be broken by God. I had to learn to trust Him. I had to experience the unknown. And I had to be forced to trust Him in seemingly impossible situations. Because it's through those times that I learned how to walk through faith. They learned how to, how to trust God. And it's these difficult times. That's why James says, consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials. Because it's the testing of your faith that develops perseverance. The, the Israelites had to go through this unknown. Because they needed to understand what it means to trust God and what God is capable of doing. So these hard times teach us to rely on God and his sovereignty and trust in his love. But instead, the Israelites wanted to know if they could do it themselves. And so they sent spies into the land. These men were leaders of their tribes. This is important. They're leaders of their tribes. These are not just 12 random people. It's not like they just drew straws, which back then was also a way that God showed people how to pick things. But in, but in our context, it's not like they just chose, drew straws and said, all right, let's just pick 12 random people. No, these were leaders of their land. These were leaders of the tribe. These were people who, who the others looked up to. They were respected and well-known. They were men who were listened to. This is important. Reflect on it a minute because those who we choose to lead us reflects on who we are. Our leaders are a glimpse. It's a, it's a mirror of who we are. We choose our leaders, and they reflect who we are as individuals and as a society. And so these 12 men were chosen, and they reflect the Israelites and who they were. It shows something of, who, of what we value and who we have as leaders. So no, notice that Numbers 13, verse 2, God says, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. 
From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. But notice it says, send men to spy out the land which I am giving to the people of Israel. God doesn't say, hey, go spy out the land to determine the best route. Go spy out the land to use your wisdom to figure out how you should go to see if you think you're capable of taking over the land. No, God says, go look at the land that I'm going to give you. See, it's not Israel's land to take. It's God's to give. And the promise that God made here does not waver. God will give his land to his people. The recipients will change from the disobedient generation to the obedient generation. See, the people knew that this land was promised to Abraham. It's why it's called the promised land. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, verses 13 through 16. And God is talking to Abraham. And God says to Abraham, The Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you... You shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. There is a lot in this passage. It's an important passage when we're looking at the conquest. When we're looking at, at Joshua and Caleb and the other ten spies. God had given this land He had promised it to Abram. Abram's descendants will be sojourners in a land, Egypt, for 400 years, and they will become servants. They will become slaves. They will be afflicted. And then God would judge that nation, and the Israelites would come out with great possessions. All of this took place. The Israelites who were with Joshua and Caleb and Moses at this point, all experienced this promise that God gave to Abram. They were in Egypt. They were afflicted. God judged the Egyptians with the plagues, ending with the Passover, where the firstborn male of every household who didn't have the blood applied to their doors died. They saw God's judgment through all of the plagues. They saw God's judgment on the army of Pharaoh as the Israelites walked through the Red Sea. And then it it came crashing down on all of the Egyptian army, killing them all. They saw, they left Egypt with great possessions, where the Bible says they plundered the Egyptians. At this point in Numbers, the Israelites saw God work in amazing ways ways. They saw God's faithfulness. They saw his glory. There is no claim of ignorance that any of them could make. God, I didn't know what you were capable of. They saw more from God physically at this. They actually saw God's physical presence. They knew who God was. They knew what God was capable of. They saw God fulfill all of these promises. But the promise to Abram continued in verse 16. They, the Israelites, shall come back here to to Canaan, the promised land. For the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet complete. And there's a lot that we could talk about, and we will at a different time, about the Amorites. But see that the Amorites were in the land with Abram. They were there. They possessed the land, and they were still in the land. When Joshua and Caleb and the spies spied out the land. Hey, Israel, I'm going to give you the Amorites. I'm going to give the Amorites into your hand. Oh, the Amorites are there. We should be afraid. You see the lack of faith. 
You see the problem. The same people in the land that God promised to the Israelites. The promises that God made in Genesis 15. See, the problem is the people, the spies, walked into the land and they took their eyes off of the promise and they started looking around. They took their eyes off of the promise, off of the faithful God. And they start looking around and they become terrified and overwhelmed by their job. Moses sends out the spies in verses 1 through 3. He gives instructions. And then in verse 25, the spies return. They come to Moses and Aaron and the people and they show the fruit of the land. The land is flowing with milk and honey. It's a sign of the abundance of the land. And the fruit was plentiful and big. It's a good report so far, right? It's, it's almost like they're setting up the rest. See, the fruit is huge. Two people. Were, it took two people to carry a cluster of grapes on a branch. The fruit was that big, that plentiful. But that's not the only thing that was big. See, they're setting it up. Look, look how big the fruit is. Look how much the, the land is flowing with milk and honey. This is an amazing land. But that's not the only thing that's big. The people are huge and they are strong. And the cities are fortified and they're well protected. The descendants of Anak, the, the giants are there. The Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites all dwell in the land as do the Canaanites. The, the Amorites, the, just saying the name Amorites should have triggered something in their heads. Should have said, oh wait, the, Am the Amorites, those are the ones that God promised that he would overcome them, that we would be given the land of the Amorites. It should have caused them to pause, but they were so focused on the things of this world that they lost sight of God's promise. They went on a journey to see the land that the Lord, the covenant God, every time you see Lord in all capitals, it's Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, had promised them and they came back doubting God's goodness, his faithfulness, and his ability. They did not believe that God was capable of giving the land that he had promised them. Remember, 12 spies were sent out. 10 spies gave the report, which was negative and disobedient. And so Caleb speaks up. Let us go at once and occupy the land, for we are able to overcome it. You have all of this negative. You ever been in those conversations where it's all negative? It's all negative. It's all negative. But in your mind, you're like, I, but, but we can do this. But God is good. God can do anything. And so Caleb speaks up. We can do this. Caleb was straight and to the point. Let's do it. Look, we're told to do it. Let's do it. God is faithful. God can carry us. God will do it. So it wasn't because Caleb thought that Israel's strength was great and that they on their own were able to overcome the people of the land. He knew the promises of God and he believed. And so the people immediately rejected Caleb's suggestion. Let's go up to the land. We're not going up to the land for they are stronger than we. Let's obey God. No, the enemy's too strong. Let's be faithful and do what God told us to do. No, it's too hard. We're not going up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. Again, their focus was on themselves and on the inhabitants of the land. I, in my own strength, cannot do this. I can't overcome them, so therefore, we're not going to go. The Israelites were small and weak, but the inhabitants of the land were big and strong and lived in fortified cities. God acknowledges this. In Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8, Moses wrote, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. 
but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your father, fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and has redeemed you from the house of slavery for the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God did not choose you, Israelites, because you are capable of doing this on your own. God chose you because you are the most incapable of doing this on your own. That's the point. Because when you are incapable of doing it on your own, that's when you realize, I can't do this. I have to stop, and I have to trust that God will do it for me. This is a great place for all of us to be. But why is it so easy for us to be like the Israelites, to fall like they do, like they did so many times? Because they don't, they didn't, and we don't believe God's promises. They didn't, and we often don't trust him. They focus on their circumstances because they can't understand how God could intervene. Remember, all of the things that they had already witnessed, and yet this held them up. They had already defeated the greatest army there was at the time, and they didn't have to do a thing other than run. How short are our memories? How weak are our wills? How often have you experienced God's goodness and then forgotten what he did and then questioned whether or not he loved you and would take care of you? Let us keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So we move from there to Numbers 14, and we're going to focus on verses 6 through 10. But let's set the stage first. The people have determined to rebel against God. They have determined they are not going to go. They wish that they had died in the wilderness. They wish that they had died in Egypt. And they accuse God of bringing them out of Egypt so that he could kill them in the promised land. And so they say that it's better to be slaves in Egypt to the point where they suggest appointing a new leader. Let's get rid of Moses and let's appoint somebody to lead us back into slavery. I mean, imagine the scenario where, where they saw the miracles of God, the plagues, the Red Sea, the bitter water made sweet, water from a rock, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, manna from heaven. The list can go on and on. But these people have seen God's provision over and over again in the miraculous and awe-inspiring ways, and yet they accuse God of bringing them out of Egypt to kill them in the promised land. How often do we do the same? God, what are you doing? I sent my son to die for you. God, don't you love me? Jesus came and gave his life so that you might live, so that I could have a relationship with you. Don't you love me? Don't you want the best for me, God? Oh, more than you can imagine. But we take our eyes off of the empty tomb and we put them on our surroundings and we say, woe is me, God must hate me now. What have I done to deserve this? And so Moses and Aaron fall on their faces. It's a sign of interceding to God on behalf of the people. And Joshua and Caleb tear their clothes it's a sign of, of lamentation, of anger, and of remorse. The four leaders, Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, they understand the implications of what the people are doing. And they demonstrate to the people the folly of their ways. You see their example here. These men could have called down God's judgment on the people. They, they could have condemned the people for their lack of faith. And yet they intercede, they lament, and they intercede. And so Joshua and Caleb speak in verse 7. It said to the congregation of the people of Israel, The land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them. 
and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. The promised land is good. There's no question about that. In fact, it's exceedingly good. But what do we see Joshua and Caleb say? If the Lord delights in us, he will give this land to us. Yahweh, the the covenant God of Israel. The focus is on God and what he has promised to do. And yet, see also that God is not obligated to do anything. If he delights in us. But, but I thought that, that God had promised to give this land to the people. That's what he told Abram. Well, he, he did and he will. But he will not give his blessings. He will not fulfill his promises to those who are not obedient to him. There are so many promises in the Bible. There are many that are just, I, God will do these things because he says he will. He will not flood the earth again. He Things like that, that he just, it's a blanket statement, I will do this. But there are so many that have to be, if you, then I. If you believe, if you repent, then I will forgive. And this is one of them. If you trust me. Because what ha- obedience is required. The Israelites cannot say, okay, God, give us this land, but we're not going in. Give us this land, but, but we're not going to go and do anything. God requires obedience. He requires them to walk. How else are they going to take the land? How else are they going to experience the, the promises and the blessings of God unless they take the steps that are necessary to take in order to receive the blessings? If the Lord delights in us, he will give us this land. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people, for they are bread for us. See this, the the people said that the land devoured the inhabitants. The land devours the inhabitants. We can't go in there because the land devours the inhabitants. What's what's Joshua and Caleb say here? They're bread to us. Who's going to do the devouring? We are. Why? Because God is with us. The land won't devour us. We will devour them because God is with us. All the protections that the spies talked about, the walls, the size of the cities, the size of the people and the armies are all removed from the inhabitants of the land because the Lord is with us, because Yahweh is with us. Do not fear this people because the Lord is with us. Do not fear your circumstances because the Lord is with us. And the response of the people is as horrible as it is predictable. They want to stone them. Listen, don't, don't, let's go to the land. We can do this. Don't rebel against God. We're going to stone you. They want to stone them. The, The initial response to having our sin pointed out is often not re, re, repentance, but defensiveness. It's justification. They put blame on Joshua and Caleb because in doing so, they don't have to focus on their own sin. They can say, well, we're going to stone you for what you said. But what they said was right. Well, I don't care if it's right. It's caused me to be angry. And so I'm going to get rid of what makes me angry. Because if I don't, then I have to address my own sin. And they didn't want to do that. They wanted to kill them because they were convicted of their own sin. And what is God's response to this situation? To show his glory. Isn't that a beautiful thing? The people were unable at that point to carry out their sinful desires. They wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. But what does God do? He shows his glory. He could have opened up the earth to swallow them. He, he did that later. He could have sent a a pestilence immediately. He did that at different times. He could have just killed them. He did that at different times. This situation, he just shows his glory. See, we are the Israelites. 
We struggle with trusting God. We have a hard time believing his promises. You know, the, the cause of every sin is unbelief. Why do you sin? Because you don't believe God's goodness. Why do you sin? Because you don't believe that God has your best interest in mind. You believe that God is holding you back. Why do you sin? Because every single one of us is like Eve, and we think that our way is better. How do we overcome this? By looking at the glory of God. When we look at God, when we understand who he is, it doesn't mean that we're capable of not sinning. We will always sin until we enter into eternity. But how do we combat our sin? By knowing who God is and by believing him. We see him. We look to him. We focus on him. And in so doing, our path is made straight and we are able to overcome, not in our own strength, not in our own power, but because of who he is and what he has done for us and the way that he lives through us. As God promised the Israelites the land, he promises us a relationship with him and eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Joshua and Caleb were able to trust him because they knew who he was. They knew what he is capable of doing and what he has promised. He is faithful. His promise is certain. When he says that he will do something, it's as good as done. It will happen. And this is a lesson for all of us, is it not? Romans 8, 31 through 39 says, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have these promises, and yet so many times we lose heart. We have these promises. We see the circumstances in our lives, and we believe that we are separated from God's love. We, are, we see our sin, and we, we believe that somehow we have to earn God's love again, or that we have to do something to receive his forgiveness. It's easy to be the Israelites. It is so easy to be the Israelites. But Joshua and Caleb show us that God is worthy to be trusted. Joshua and Caleb are not perfect people. Do not look to Joshua and Caleb and figure out how to live your life. The, the people of the Bible are not there to tell us how to live. But sh they show us that God is worthy to be trusted. That God is faithful and he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Do not look to Joshua and Caleb to gain strength. Instead, look to them to see the faithfulness of God. He is good, he is faithful, and he can be trusted. Therefore, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, and Nordonia, please go to our website at thechapel.life.